NFL players, coaches, and owners took part in historic protest on Sunday, sitting out, taking a knee, and linking arms during pre-game national anthems played across the country and in London after a weekend of tweets and comments by President Donald Trump targeting protesting players and disinviting NBA champion Golden State Warriors superstar Steph Curry after he indicated he would not visit the White House. He's fired. We get a response from John Angelos, the executive vice president of the Baltimore Orioles, who during the uprising against the police killing of Freddie Gray, criticized those who focused on fans being delayed in leaving an Orioles game with tweets that included, quote, there's a far bigger picture for poor Americans in Baltimore and everywhere. This makes inconvenience at a ball game irrelevant. The weekend showed a powerful outpouring of solidarity by and from people across the sports world and across this entire country at all different economic levels, all different ethnic backgrounds, all different points of view, by and large, who came together around a simple idea. Um, I think two ideas. First, that freedom of speech is an inalienable and non-cancelable right of all Americans. And secondly, that right cannot be canceled or abridged in any appropriate public forum. And then third, the government, in the form of the highest office of, of the uh, country, the White House, the presidential administration, cannot hijack uh, American institutions like the White House, which is owned by the taxpayers, not by any one person, like the powers that, that come along with a presidency or political office, which is conferred by the people, not owned by individuals. They cannot hijack those institutions and those assets and use them to chill or destroy the ability of individual Americans to express themselves. Whether one agrees with that individual American, Colin Kaepernick, um, or someone at the other end of the spectrum who thinks what Colin Kaepernick is doing and what others have, have done with respect to kneeling during the uh, national anthem or standing during the national anthem or what have you, whether you agree or disagree with those people, we should all come together around the idea that we all have that inalienable right. No one can take it away from us. And certainly no governmental institution or governmental uh, elected official can attempt to abuse and distort their powers to take that right away from us. And I think that was very powerful this weekend to see, as you said, owners and players and front office executives um, and artists, uh, musicians and, and, and people from every walk of life. Um, the extraordinary uh, th those that don't get a lot of attention coming together around those ideals. And that's what the United States of America is supposed to be about. And I think if we keep pushing, as so many people did this weekend, uh, it will, the United States will be able to, as a country, come together and restore uh, and reinforce and restate that the country is about those things. You mentioned the owners. So some owners like Robert Kraft said they were disappointed by Trump and they expressed solidarity with the protests. But he's among the owners that also gave you know, heavily to Trump, a million dollars. He's also among the NFL owners who have refused to hire Colin Kaepernick, who many say is as or more qualified to, to play in the NFL as many starting, starting quarterbacks today. And many say that Kaepernick has been blacklisted for his political stance. Um, how do you respond to that? Well, as the second part of that, of, of, of the question, and uh, the theories on why any one player is not in a league at any moment or why Colin Kaepernick's not in the NFL. I'm, I'm not a football executive, I'm not from the football world, and I'm certainly not an expert on football talent, nor do I have any knowledge or um, uh, understanding in order to form a conclusion anyway as to whether there is some collusive or conspiracy to keep Colin Kaepernick out of the NFL. So I. I, I couldn't say one way or another on that. That would be for other people to say. Um, as to owners who have supported political candidates, whether they were the, whether they supported this particular president when running for office or supported other Republicans or other Democrats, it certainly is a powerful statement when someone who is an owner in the NFL and who supported a candidate says that they are um, find the comments that were made to be unacceptable. Um, that says a lot. 
And similar, similarly, I believe this morning, Tom Brady came out and uh, said that he um, did not support the comments that were made and that they were divisive and so forth without, at the risk of misquoting him. I think that's the thrust of what he was saying. Um, I was at a, a, an event this weekend, um, which I, I think has appeared and should have appeared in the news by now where, uh, uh, Eddie Vedder, uh, the, the front man for Pearl Jam, took a knee um, right before his performance start, started at a music festival. It was not a um, an Eddie Vedder show. It was it, he was just one of the acts there. So it wasn't that he did it in front of a crowd that was 110 percent Eddie Vedder fans or Pearl Jam fans. It was a diverse crowd. He took a knee and he did it in Nashville, Tennessee. OK, so not not in um, in a part of the country that's necessarily known for one political leaning or another, if anything, maybe people would say it's, it, it skews more conservative. I don't know if that's the case. So you saw some NASCAR owners come out very strongly and saying they would fire people who knelt during the anthem. And then you saw, uh, I believe, Dale Earnhardt Jr. come out this morning and say the exact opposite, that he was supportive of the right of free speech, uh, that that's a right that every every American has and diversity and dissent and so forth are important. So um, there are many people that have rallied to this idea. It shouldn't be a controversial idea. It's the foundation and the bedrock of the country. During the uprising in Baltimore over the police killing of Freddie Gray, you defended the protests. You said instead of focusing on a few cases of property damage, the outrage should be focused on the economic plunder of the middle class over the past some half century. You know, it's plunged tens of millions of good working, good hardworking Americans into economic devastation, eroded civil rights, impoverished uh, the public living under a militarized surveillance state. To sort of paraphrase, paraphrase um, your your thoughts on Twitter, um, and uh, you know, the whole protest was against police brutality, the killing of an unarmed black man in Baltimore. I wanted to get your reflection on, on what's changed in Baltimore over, over the past few years since Freddie Gray's death. And if you think, um, you know, that if, if you, you know, maintain those thoughts today and, you know, we're looking at uh, a nation that is, you know, those protests since the killing of Freddie Gray and Tamir Rice uh, and Eric Garner and, you know, Michael Brown, those, those protests have continued and, you know, unarmed black men continue to be killed by police, and you have a president who has, um, you know, defended police brutality essentially and uh, empowered uh, police. Many say. Well, let me first say that my comments at that time were in reaction to initially a conversation that was being held between some other folks on Twitter, where they were focusing on the inconvenience that potentially was being caused or that was being caused to fans trying to attend a game. And my broadest comment was, or point was, that's a lack, that shows a lack of perspective. The, the issues here are multiple and they're deep and broad and they go to the issues of systemic poverty, again, among people of all races and ethnic backgrounds. Yes, poverty skews in a variety of ways. Poverty mostly follows lack of economic opportunity, and that is colorblind. Lack of economic opportunity will destroy any uh, communities or sub-communities. It leads to poverty, and in turn leads to crime and drug addiction and a, a, dis, a, dis, uh, a depressed uh, a morale and point of view generally. So that was the, the, the origin of my comments. Um, and let me say something about police brutality for a second. Um, that, that was not really my primary focus. My prime, you know, at, at Camden Yards, we only use Baltimore City police officers for security. We don't use private security because we think it's best to use Baltimore City police officers. We've also used Maryland State troopers because properly trained and well-intended, which the majority of police officers are, well-intended, properly trained, and people just like any other group of people that are out to do their job, do it well, um, go home and take care of their families. There are, of course, people that uh, uh, break the code and uh, uh, engage in police brutality. Just like in any profession, you have people that um, don't uphold the standards that are, are required. And um, the, the question on the table for society in this society recently has been, well, to what extent has 
that percentage of people who break the code that the overwhelming majority of police officers do uphold every day, to what extent is that group grown or not grown? And what is the police forces, what are the police forces doing to self-regulate and to get rid of the people that are committing these terrible acts and only bring into their ranks people who are like the majority? So I think that was the larger context of that. Uh, the other issue was that, yes, there were some people engaging in illegal acts of vandalism and violence, although that was primarily confined to a couple of days here and there. There were a lot of peaceful protests. There was a large student protest, as you know, um, uh, which I think originated at Johns Hopkins and culminated at, at or Loyola, I'm not sure exactly where it started, and culminated at City Hall. And that was really interesting because it was young people from all different colleges and universities, clearly of different e economic backgrounds, students and non-students. Again, we're back to the same issue of constitutional right to free speech, not to be abridged by the government in any way. So I was speaking out in support of people coming together to saying, let's fix what's wrong in the in society. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, from Freddie Gray in Baltimore to, you mentioned Adam Jones, you mentioned, you talked about these larger protest areas, the protest topics. Um, it's the same issue keeps coming back. Is the government being acting appropriately and responsibly and responsibly to the needs of the community? And um, um, you're not you're not seeing it today. Um, it's, it's encouraging to see people coming together as they have over the weekend. Um, hopefully that will translate to to something that uh, people here can can react to and feel better about. Talk about how the Orioles would react to a protest by an Orioles player. Uh, we know that uh, Adam Jones heard racial slurs, had a bag of peanuts thrown at him while playing in the outfield in uh, Fenway Park earlier this season. Um, and uh, last year, speaking to USA Today, uh, responding to Kaepernick's protest, he says, uh, he said, quote, so you might not as well kick yourself out of the game in football. You, you can't kick them out. You need those players in baseball. They don't need us. Baseball is a white man's sport. Well, Adam has been throughout his career a very thoughtful person who has um, not been um, averse to um, expressing um, his point of view and, 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 and utilizing his right to free speech to engage in dialogue and, and discourse. I think those comments were made in a, in a larger context of being asked about the demographics, the changing demographics of, of baseball and sports. Baseball is, I think, you know, the demographics of baseball have changed somewhat. It's, it's, it's often focused on the, the percentage of African-American players has declined. What isn't often focused upon is the, the percentage of white American players and white players has also declined. And the reason for that is that the uh, twofold, that Hispanic players and uh, Latin American based players and Asian players have um, increased in uh, participation in the league. The league has become a more global league and there's a, there's a finite number of jobs. There are, until, unless we expand and have more clubs, which has been talked about by the commissioner's office, you have, you have 30 clubs, 750 jobs, to the extent that players are being scouted and drafted and recruited from all over the world, which is, is the case today far more so than just five years ago or certainly 25 years ago, those proportions are going to change. When the best example of that would be a player, a great Hall of Fame, or will be a Hall of Fame player in Ichiro, before Ichiro decided to leave the Japanese League, bring his immense talent to Major League Baseball, there was a job for another player. That could have been an Asian player, a Latin American, African American, or white American, or, 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 or white or ethnic background from any part of the world, as soon as Ichiro comes, obviously, he takes someone's job. That's not really related to any other forces other than the game is globalizing. Um, you know, I think, I think Adam's concerns about the decline, especially in lower income groups, whether that's, you know, sports has become, whether that's African American or white American, um, there are more poor white people in the United States than African American, a poor, um, a poverty in this country is an immense problem. The ability of poor communities to participate in sport has become incredibly problematic 
because in particular in baseball, but in many other sports because of the rise of elite travel sports in the youth sports industry, which is incredibly expensive. Middle income folks and even wealthier people, it's a big, it's a large chunk of their disposable income. So when you're talking about people that live in poverty, whether it's urban poverty or rural poverty, and again, more poor people live in rural areas than urban areas, it's very hard for those parents to enable their children to participate in this youth sports industry. That has fenced out a lot of African-American kids and a lot of poor kids generally. So uh, that's how I view Adam's, Adam's thoughts on that. Um, and, um, and, and, I, and I share his concerns about the fencing out of opportunity in pro sports for particularly people from diverse backgrounds and even more so people from uh, poverty-stricken areas. For The Real News, this is Jessel Noor in Baltimore.